going to be in 2 Timothy chapter 3 this morning, 2 Timothy chapter 3. And remind the boys and girls that they are dismissed for Children's Church at this time. And if you didn't get a copy of the notes, there are some notes back there for you as well. Have you ever needed a detox? Ever needed a detox? There are, uh, there are all kinds of ways that people detox, but it's, it's become popular today for people to do certain things to detoxify their body from harmful substances or toxins. I looked this up recently, popular ways to detox. I found a wide assortment. Uh, first one was fasting. You could do a juice cleanse. You could take some sort of dietary supplement like a pill or a powder. An easy one to detox is just to simply drink more water. There are even certain antioxidant foods or berries that you could eat. Uh, I remember one time my wife and I did some sort of tea cleanse. You would drink this tea and it was supposed to uh, cleanse on the inside. But one thing my wife has done, though she hasn't done it as much recently since moving, she used to do this a lot, is she used to juice celery juice. And she would drink that, and she bought a, a juicer for that purpose, and she would take, you know, the celery stalks and put it through the juicer and uh, take uh, the celery juice. Now, I don't know if you've ever tasted celery juice. I like celery, but I cannot handle <laughs> celery juice. Uh, I don't know if you could get a whole glass in me, though she's tried. It, it, it's that bad. I, I just don't really like that. Uh, but people do it. And they, they do these things and do these rituals that they think will be helpful and healthy for you to help detoxify your body from harmful substances. And the church is very similar. In fact, Scripture describes the church as a body. And just like we can get toxic substances in our body, and every so often we just need to detox, sometimes there can be toxic things in churches. Toxic people, toxic ideas, toxic behavior that we just need to detox from. And in our text today from 2 Timothy 3, Paul talks about these types of things in the church. And he gives us some stern warnings. In the context here, in the end of chapter 2 of 2 Timothy, Paul talks about people that he calls vessels of dishonor. And he compares vessels of honor to vessels of dishonor. And as he transitions into our text this morning in chapter 3, he continues this discussion on vessels of dishonor, and he even goes even more into detail. So let's look at the words that God has for us today. 2 Timothy 3, verses 1 through 9. You can follow along in your copy of the scriptures. I'll be reading from my translation this morning. Paul says, but realize these things. In last days, difficult times will come. For men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, brutal, haters of good, traitors, reckless, being conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness, but its power have denied, and these ones avoid." For among them are the ones slipping into households and taking captive weak women, having been weighed down with sin, being led on by various desires, always learning and never being able to come to knowledge of the truth. In the same way, Jonas and Jambres oppose Moses, thus also these ones oppose the truth. Men having been depraved of mind, disqualified concerning the faith. They will not make further progress for their folly, will be obvious to all, as also those ones folly became obvious. Here Paul warns us, he cautions us, the reality of toxic people with toxic influences, even in the church. And I think from Paul's statement today, we come away with one big idea, uh, and it's the truth I want you to take home this morning. Very simply, sometimes we need a detox from toxic people. 
And so as we unpack our text this morning, I'd like to ask the question, how do we identify How do we identify people who may be the type of people that Paul talks about in our text? And maybe we even need to detox from these type of people. In our text, Paul gives us four unmistakable identifiers of those who are toxic. First one this morning comes from the first few verses of our text. Toxic people approve carnal behavior. They approve carnal behavior. And verses 2 through 4 of our text are all about uh, the carnality of those who are toxic in the church. But before Paul goes there in verse 1, he gives a blanket statement, kind of introducing the topic. You can see it in your copy of the scriptures. He says, but realize these things that in uh, in the last days, difficult times will come. And Paul gives a a stern warning here to Timothy, his young pastoral protege. If you didn't realize it before, realize it now. Difficult times will come in the last days. What are these last days? We could spend a whole, whole Sunday morning sermon talking about what those are. I believe these last days are what we call the church age, the last days before Christ comes in what we call the rapture, to rapture his bride, the church, and take her to be with him. And this was something that Paul and Timothy were experiencing and seeing even in their days a couple thousand years ago. And we are experiencing today as well. And so Paul tells Timothy, make no mistake, Timothy, difficult times will come. Notice Paul's description here. He calls them difficult or dangerous times. And notice also the certainty they will come. They will come. There's no doubt about it. And so as a believer, we should not be surprised by what we see in the world today. We should not be surprised by the erosion of the moral imagination or the Christian worldview in our secular culture at large. Even in churches today, don't let that surprise you. Paul talked about it 2,000 years ago. And Paul goes on to talk about what this looks like in the church. And he tells us that toxic people in the church approve carnal behavior. Boys and girls, if you're following along in the children's worksheets, you can draw a picture of someone who's behaving in a carnal or sinful way. You can see what I drew up there. But Paul gives a list, a very lengthy list in the text of 18 different descriptors of these people. And we might look at that list today and we might say, oh yeah, I can see this happening in the world all around us. Paul Paul has it right. Yeah, I just have to go to the grocery store or the supermarket and I can see. But don't forget what Paul has in mind here is not the world around He's talking in the context of the church. He's talking to his pastoral protege, Timothy. I want to remind you that these people will be around and they might even be in the church. He's essentially telling Timothy, Timothy, guard the church. Why? Because it can be full of these type of people. In the last days, people will be full of, or churches will be full of people who want what they want and do what they want. And it's a dangerous thing. Now, if you look at Paul's description here of all these 18 descriptors in the text, notice the first one starts with self-love, our desire for self-love, lovers of self And our desire for self-love often overtakes our lives and even overtakes the church today. We have all these movements in the church for self-love and self-esteem and self-fulfillment. I wish I had time to go more into today about some of the popular literature that's out there, which is all based on self-love and has nothing to do with loving God. But Paul says these types of things happen in the church And what does it look like when you get self-love into the church? Well, Paul gives us a list. 18 descriptors of what that looks like. And so we're going to walk through them briefly this morning. In fact, I thought about 
making this a two-part sermon, but I kind of wanted to get through it. Last time I preached this sermon, I preached it in a church that had a longer uh, sermon time, and I think I went 55 minutes. I won't do that this morning, but I'm wishing I had that amount of time because there's a lot of stuff here. Notice what he says in the text, lovers of money. Makes sense if you're going to be a lover of self, that you're going to be a lover of money, right? Uh, The Greek word is just one word in the Greek. It's silver lovers. Scripture tells us the love of money is the root to all sorts of evil. Paul mentions boastful, a boastful person. This is someone who's bragging, self-absorbed. He pairs that with an arrogant person showing feelings of unwanted importance. He mentions the word revilers. The Greek word here is the word blasphemos. Talks of someone who's just irreverent to what's sacred person who can play church with the best of them, but there's this inner contempt or hatred for what's going on here. In the list, you'll notice Paul says disobedient to parents. Heard it said that this is a downfall of a society. When children rise up against their parents, we have destruction in the home. It's not a good thing. Paul describes these people as ungrateful. They have an ungrateful attitude. Can't even say, I thank you. Just want more and more and more. He says they're unholy. It could be translated as profane. It refers to shameful behavior. Could be thought of the absence of common decency. Paul mentions unloving, acting in an unloving way. He says irreconcilable. This is the type of person who doesn't respond to an appeal. You can't gain the goodwill of them by any formal means of peacemaking. They just won't let you have it. They refuse to be reconciled. Oftentimes, this is what happens with people who have a history of leaving churches and and church hopping from one church to the next. They get their feelings hurt because someone didn't do what they wanted to do, and they play the victim card and refuse to be reconciled, and so they just go somewhere else. That's why as a pastor, I always, when I get church transfers from other local churches, I always call up their pastor and say, hey, anything I need to know? Be interesting what you can learn. Paul uses, he mentions that they're slanderous. You can see that in the text. The Greek word here is diabolos, the word for devil. Someone who is an accuser of the brethren, just like the devil in the church. He says they are without self-control, someone who's unrestrained. He says they are brutal, like a wild, untamable beast. He says they're haters of good. They are traitors. They're a betrayer. You can't trust them. You can't give them any confidences because they'll turn on you. They won't keep them. They fake friendship and use information about you to bring it against you. He mentions reckless, someone who is headstrong. They plow forward without thinking. He says they are conceited or puffed up. He says they are lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. That's where he ends up. He started off with self-love. Now he ends with lovers of, of pleasure. What a description. I mean, 18 descriptors of the type of people that will be in churches. What a reminder. That there are toxic people, even in churches today, people who would derail a ministry. And Paul describes them for us. Paul tells us to avoid them. It's actually a command in this text. This is the only imperative in this text at the end of verse 5. He says, avoid them. That's where I get our big idea from this morning. Sometimes you need to detox from toxic people. Paul says, avoid them. Sometimes we need to detox from toxic people. Toxic people approve carnal behavior. But if we go on in our text, we find that toxic people mask inward character. They hide who they really are. Look at it in verse 5 with me. Paul says, holding to a form of godliness, but its power have denied these ones of Paul further describes these people. He says they have a form of godliness. Notice that word form. They have a form of godliness. It's the appearance or the embodiment. Things look great on the outside. They can put on a show and look spiritual with the rest of them, but things are not going well on the inside. Some have described them as having ritual without 
relationship. It's just for show. They have a dedication, but there's no relationship there. There's been no, perhaps, internal heart change. They're spiritual fakes. They come in with the appearance of Christianity, but all they really want is to deceive and law people into following them. I, I really like how John MacArthur put it in his commentary on this passage. He said, the enemy of the church is not the man standing on the outside speaking against religion. The enemy that threatens the life of the church is the man on the inside who says he's religious and lies. Wow, what a statement. We need to be careful of these people. The type of people Paul describes in our text have never been changed by Christ. They're just putting on a good performance. and Some of them are really good at it. But these types of people, Paul cautions us about, they are toxic in the church. And he reminds us sometimes we need to detox from toxic people. Now, I want to remind you, and I want to make sure we keep this uh, passage in its context here. Remember, this book, 2 Timothy, was written to a pastor. This was written to Pastor Timothy and his ministry at the church, and I, I believe because of that, it most directly applies to pastors. Well, what does this mean? Well, I think it means that there are some people in the church that are so toxic that pastors, Paul's telling Timothy here, pastors need to avoid them. They're never going to change. They're never going to grow apart from a work of the Holy Spirit. And that's why Paul tells Timothy what he tells him in chapter 2. If you're going to invest in somebody, Timothy, pastors, who do you invest in? Invest in the faithful men. Those who will train others also. Don't waste your time with toxic people, Paul tells pastors. Paul tells Timothy, pastors ought not to waste their time with these people. Why? Because these type of people will ruin the ministry of a pastor. Oftentimes they, they suck the life out of him to where they can't go on any longer. And I'm saddened to say that being in ministry and even working for Central Seminary and going around to different churches, I've seen this happen time and time again. First time I preached on this passage was two and a half years ago. And I had a man in my mind that I saw this happen to two and a half years ago. And in the two and a half years since I preached this sermon, two and a half years later, I know of several more men who've been destroyed by toxic people in the church, godly men who've had their life sucked out of them because they've been burned by toxic people. In fact, I think two of them have been to preach in this church before. And they bear the scars of toxic people who went up against them and tried to destroy their ministry. And some of them may never go into ministry again because of the burden. And so I say to those of you who are here who might, might kind of find yourself in that category of, yeah, I, I've kind of been toxic. You don't want that weight on your shoulders. You don't want that weight of your pastor having to be the person that says, I'm going to avoid them because they're toxic. You definitely don't want to be the person who the pastor says, I can't do ministry anymore because of that guy or that lady. And to those of you who are here who are trying to do the right thing and you're trying to serve Jesus and you want to learn and grow, I echo what Paul says here. Watch out. Watch out for toxic people. The early church was full of them. Churches today are full of them. Watch out. Sometimes we need a detox from toxic people. Go back to our text in verses 6 and 7, and Paul continues this description here. Toxic people ruin vulnerable people. They ruin vulnerable people. Boys and girls, if you're following along here, you can draw a picture of someone who ruined the life of another because of their sin. I drew the story of Cain and Abel. Familiar story there. Brother kills his brother. But notice what Paul writes in verses 6 and 7 of our text, describing these toxic people. He says, Among them are ones slipping into households, taking captive weak women, having been weighed down with sin, being led by various desires, always learning and never being able to come to knowledge of the truth. Now follow what Paul is saying here. 
He just gave this admonition, avoid these men. He gives a list of 18 descriptors of their character. And now he takes it a step further in his description. He says, some of them, maybe not all of them, but some of them use their deception to ruin vulnerable people. Now we need to talk about that and unpack what he means when he says that. Notice he says they are slipping into households. I think this is significant. They can't get you at church, they'll get you at home. Oftentimes, ministry happens in the church, disunity happens in the home or someplace outside the local gathering of believers. That's apparently what we have here in Paul's day. Uh, these people have moved outside the, the church meetings, and now they're getting into homes of individuals, sneaking around outside the site of church leadership, preying upon vulnerable people in the church. And many times these type of people use the home as their chief area of battleground for their deception. Paul says they slip into households and they lead them astray. Notice he says that they are taking captive weak women. I don't think this is a judgment here on all women. He's not saying all women are vulnerable to the ploys of toxic people. Don't misunderstand that. But I do think this is what was going on in Ephesus at the time. And that's why Paul says what he says. And we're kind of familiar with that in our world today, right? Who do you think cults chiefly cater to? Vulnerable women. Is it any wonder why the Jehovah's Witnesses come during the day? Who do you think they expect to find at home? Probably the mom, the vulnerable woman. That, that, that's how they do their craft. As apparently was happening in Paul's day. Toxic people use their deceptive lifestyle to ruin those who are vulnerable. And I would say, I don't think this is limited to women. Women. This is what was happening in Paul's day, but certainly not limited to women. There are a lot of vulnerable men out there too. One commentator wrote this, Beware of those who prey on others' vulnerabilities. They have hidden intentions. And notice Paul's description of, of these women here. He says they are weighed down by their sin. I think there's a good life principle here the way down it means to be piled up or heaped up life principle is this when we live in sin we're spiritually vulnerable i think that's a good principle when we live in sin we're spiritually vulnerable and paul talks about this in the text and he gives us this description of these vulnerable women in the church he says they are always learning never being able to come to knowledge of the truth interesting description here Sure, there's plenty of knowledge. Sure, these people know many things. They perhaps sat in church for years. Maybe they were Sunday school teachers or Bible class workers. They have this knowledge, but knowledge doesn't do you any good if you don't use it. These individuals here that Paul describes have all kinds of head knowledge, but they've never learned to put it into practice. That's why Paul says, they are never able to come to knowledge of the truth. Did you know that you can have all the spiritual learning in the world? You can have all the learning in the world and still be spiritually foolish. You can know all sorts of information and never achieve wisdom. And this is the difference of, between what I like to call an informational culture and a transformational culture. And I like to talk about this, and I mention it a lot, because this is often a struggle in churches today, particularly conservative churches. Many times we equate learning with spirituality. And so we give ourselves to learning and knowing the Bible and, and knowing more, which isn't a bad endeavor. And we know so much doctrine and so much theology and so much scripture, but many times we're not transformed by it. My experience is some of the churches that have the most faithful, biblically literate, knowledgeable people have the most struggles with carnal Corinthian hearted churches and church members. Because people are always growing, but they never learn. They never come to a knowledge 
And this is Paul's description of vulnerable women in the church in Ephesus. And again, I don't think it's limited to women. We all need to be careful that we do not allow ourselves to be corrupted or led astray by those who might try to, uh, to lead us. That we're not so consumed with piling vast amounts of biblical knowledge into our mental filing cabinets that we don't let it get to our hearts. Paul reminds us sometimes we need to detox from toxic people. Like what uh, Spurgeon said, the greatest enemy to human souls is the self-righteous spirit which makes me look to them, men look to themselves for salvation. Continuing on in our text, we find our fourth identifier of toxic people. Toxic people hinder personal growth. They hinder their own personal growth. Look at it in the text, verses 8 and 9. Paul says, In the same way, Jonas and Jambres opposed Moses. Thus also these ones oppose the truth, men having been depraved of mind, disqualified concerning the faith, and they will not make further progress, for their folly will be obvious, as also those ones' folly became obvious. Paul makes this comparison here between toxic people in the church and these two individuals, Jonas and Jambres. Well, who are they? We don't really find record of them in Scripture. But uh, church history and tradition says these were the magicians who opposed Moses when he stood before Pharaoh. Remember this story? Moses stood before Pharaoh and he threw down his staff and it turned into a serpent. He picked it up and it turned back in. He touched the river and it turned into blood. And he touched it again and it turned back. Well, Pharaoh had some magicians who did the same things, performed the same, uh, same miracles, And tradition says that these two guys were named Jonas and Jambres. And Paul makes this connection here between these guys and toxic people in the church. Just like these men oppose Moses, so the type of people Paul's describing in the church are opposed to the work of God. They may not think they are. In fact, oftentimes they have this belief that they are doing God's will. They're standing up for truth. They're holding the line but they're in opposition to leadership. They're whispering in secret corners to people, gossiping, spreading rumors. This type of person cannot follow leadership, and so when they can't make headway inside the church, Paul says they they go to the home. They meet with people privately. And notice the point of the illustration here. Jonathan Jammers performed the same miracles that Moses did. They did the same things, but their power was not of God. And there are people in churches today who are like this. They look like their lives have been transformed by the very same power of the Holy Spirit. They put on a show, but it's a facade. It's a farce. As Paul says earlier, they have the appearance of godliness, but have denied the power thereof. They've opposed the truth. They might think they are chosen truth, but it's just their truth. It's just their way. They're going solo. They're becoming lone rangers in their spiritual life. They are choosing their truth, but it is not the truth. That's a kind of a big movement in our world today, isn't it? Your truth. Thank you, Oprah Winfrey, for popularizing that concept of speaking your truth. Problem is, there's no such thing. There's God's truth and there's Satan's lies. There's nothing in between. It's either right or wrong, black or white. And these people that Paul describes, they're choosing Satan's lies and they're masking it as God's truth. That's what Paul tells us in the text. He says, these also, these ones oppose the truth. Men having been depraved of mind, disqualified concerning the faith, they've been gone so far in their spiritual lives, that if something doesn't change and change quickly, they're going to be ruined. They're going to be shipwrecked in their faith. They are spoiled in their mind, and likely there really was no spiritual relationship there to begin with. When I was in Bible college, I had a theology professor, Dr. Lemansky, Kurt Lemansky. 
And this, uh, this theology professor enjoyed making his exams extremely difficult. And he would give us these multiple choice questions where there are four answers and three of them were heresy and one of them was true and he would word them in such a way that if you chose the wrong answer, you choose the heretical answer as opposed to the orthodox answer. And, uh, and he made these tests so hard and a large percentage of the tech the, the, the class would just bomb the test and he would grade on like a huge curve. I think one time I remember getting like 30 points back on the curve. Shows you how well I did in theology class. Um, but Paul teaches us here that God doesn't grade on a curve. God doesn't grade on a curve. You can't fail God's test and somehow uh, still be one of his. You can't have everything right on the outside and no heart on the inside and still be one of his. God doesn't grade on a curve. Either pass or fail God's test. Either pass or fail. And I wonder, ask yourself, search your heart. If God examined your heart today, what would he find? Pass or fail? Jesus reminds us in Matthew 7, verse 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does my will and the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Paul writes us to warn warn us, these people, these toxic people, they hinder personal growth. Look at what Paul says in the end of the text. They will not make further progress. One day... God and his sovereign rule is going to stop their influence. You better watch out. If you're one of these people, God will stop you one day. Paul says their folly, notice with it in the text, their folly will be obvious to all. Just as the folly of Jonas and Jambres were. Watch out, toxic people in the church. Watch out those who want to wrangle and fight, who want to creep into homes and gain a following. Watch out those of you who can't follow leadership and want to take control for yourself. Watch out those of you who are always learning and never come to knowledge of the truth. One day God is going to reveal to those around that you are a fool. And if this is you, Paul reminds us very simply, one day your heart will come out. Can't hide forever. Toxic people, one day everyone will be able to see. That's what Paul means when he says your folly will be obvious to all. Paul reminds us we need to detox from toxic people. Toxic people approve carnal behavior. They mask inward character. They ruin vulnerable people and they hinder personal growth. Sometimes we need a detox from toxic people. In our home, we've had a problem for uh, several summers. We actually didn't have it this past summer, probably because we were in transition. But the past summers before that, we had a problem with our trash can. When I went to take out the trash, I would find that there were these maggots growing in our trash can. And I don't know why these maggots were growing. I mean, we do have boys who throw all kinds of stuff in the trash can. Uh, And and they like to, you know, do things like that. But uh, it didn't matter what type of trash bags we would use. We had these nice scented trash bags, you know, that would smell like lavender. You know, you're putting them in the main trash can inside. Ah, it just smells so good. It didn't matter how good our trash bags smell we would still get these maggots in our trash can. And pretty soon, let me tell you, they didn't smell like lavender any longer. And it's a simple concept. It didn't matter what we put the trash in on the outside. If the inside was rotten, it was going to affect the whole can. I wouldn't expect to open the lid and have the whole thing smell flowery and fresh. Why? Because what was on the inside came out and it ruined the entire load of trash and it's the same way in our spiritual lives and in the church you can't expect to have a corrupt inside and everything stay nice and fresh on the outside one day what is inside will eventually come out it will corrupt you it will spoil you it will spoil those around you and everyone will be able to see so what do we do What do we do? 
What do we do about this? What are some practical takeaways we can take from this text on dealing with toxic people? Let me give you some thoughts. And some of these come from an article that I read on this topic and I found to be really helpful. Some next steps for you this week. First of all, don't view it your mission to stop toxic people from sinning. Don't try to control a controller. Work around them as you're required to. Don't leather ups and downs. Become your ups and downs. Keep a healthy level of distance. Keep first things first. Our job isn't to stop people from sinning. Maybe you need to have a tweak in your focus. Focus on investing in reliable people. 2 Timothy 2.2 type of mentality. Maybe a practical step for you this week is to set up a specific prayer time to ask God to give you grace as you deal with sinning people, recognizing that God gives the same grace to you. Here's another next step. Don't let their toxicity become yours. Guard against letting someone else's toxic behavior tempt you to respond in the same fashion. We can't control what other people do and say, but we can control what we do and say. Don't allow someone who is ruining their life to ruin yours as well. Maybe for you it means leave work at work or leave family drama, family gatherings or wherever it appears in your life. And maybe for you, you need to spend some specific time in prayer this week just asking God to protect you from the influence of those who are toxic around you. Maybe it's a partner at work. Maybe it's someone in the church. Maybe it's your next door neighbor. Maybe you need to read through some Proverbs and notice the difference between the wise and the foolish. and Let that guide you in your relationship. Number three, speak truth to toxic people. Maybe you know some of them in your life. We live by truth. We don't have to pretend toxic people aren't toxic. We just have to learn a non-toxic way of interacting with them. And so pray for them. Give them snippets of truth and let God work. Maybe for you, as you leave today, you need to ask God for wisdom and how to have hard conversations. Sometimes we need to have hard conversations, don't we? Look at some of the examples in the Bible of how Jesus did it. And then finally, remember to love toxic people as Jesus loved them. It can be so easy for us to just kind of pass them off. Oh, I need to stay away from that person. Paul says to avoid. And we never love them. We never pray for them. We don't treat them with the love of Christ. Remember, Jesus ministered to a toxic person for three years before his toxic influence was revealed to everyone. And sometimes Jesus did leave toxic people and walk away from them, but other times he let them experience his ministry. And so for us, we still need to love those people like Jesus did. We still need to desire and seek their repentance. This is where the gospel fits into the situation. We still need to call people to gospel living. And so maybe as you leave today, you need to ask God to give you his heart for broken people. Read through one of the Gospels this week. See how Jesus did that, how he responded to broken people all around him. Well, these are some practical ways that we can put this text into our lives this week. Paul warns Timothy, there are toxic people in the church. We need to guard ourselves so we don't become toxic and corrupt as well. Sometimes we need to detox from toxic people. Imagine what our church would be like if everyone here today made a commitment. If there's any toxic elements in my heart, I'm going to get rid of that. I'm going to take care of that. If there's anyone I need to talk to, I'm, I'm going to do that and deal with that biblically. And I'm going to make sure that toxic people around me don't have an influence. That I'm not uh, made toxic by being in association with them. I'm going to detox from toxic people. Imagine what our church would be, what your home would be, what your workplace would be, what your family gatherings would be if you decided, I'm going to take this text, I'm going to work it in my life this week. Would you commit to doing that as we leave this morning? Let's pray together. Father God, thank you for your love. Thank you for your truth. Thank you for your word. We know your word is truth, and sometimes it's not easy for us to hear. It might be difficult. And our text this morning is a hard look at what can so easily creep into all of our lives. Maybe we don't match 
all of the descriptions that Paul gives in this text, but sometimes there are toxic elements that creep into our lives. Even sin itself is toxic. We ask you to help us, that we would learn to remove ourselves when we need to remove ourselves, that we would learn to minister when we need to stay and minister, that we would not allow other people's toxic behavior to control our behavior, and that we would learn to love them like Jesus. Help us, Father, as we go out to be able to do that today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.